Okay, so we're going to start the meeting at 6.03. Um, I need someone to make a motion to uh, accept the agenda. So moved. Anyone for a second? Uh, Derek, you want to go for a second? Okay. Is there anything we need to um, add or subtract from the agenda, Jean? I don't think there is. No, other than I will be asking for an executive session to discuss the budget parameters because they affect negotiations. Okay. Great. Uh, then with that, um, all those that approve the agenda, please uh, press your little green button. And those who uh, do not want to accept the agenda, please press the red button. Laura, remind me, how do I get to green and red button? Oh, you have to go down to where it says participants. Yeah. Click on that, and then it brings you over to the list. Got it. At the bottom. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We've got an approved agenda. Next item is communications with parents, citizens, and staff. I don't see anybody online who wants to talk to us, and I can tell you that there has not been any uh, board let's talk communications in, uh, since our last meeting. So, hello, Bonnie C. And Barbara has arrived too. Oh, oh and hello, Barbara. Okay, so we've um, accepted our agenda and we um, have gone through communications with parents, citizens, and staff. So we're going to move on to our board professional development piece. Um, our first item is the September 23rd professional development recap and reflection on the, we would like to put that on our October 21st agenda um, and recap uh, what happened during that meeting since that really is our PD. The second meetings of the month are our PD meetings or uh, our where we do something different than just our regular board meeting. Does anybody have a problem with that? I have a question. Sure. Uh, are you, is it on tonight's agenda just to shift to the 21st? It should be the 21st anyway, our next board meeting, because the first and third Wednesday. So what are we doing tonight? Tonight, it, what's on our agenda? Yeah, but well, I'm going to look at the agenda again for a second here. OK. So I just wanted to say that I thought that was extremely valuable what we did at the last meeting and I applaud the board for doing it, the folks who got it set up. Um, I think it's important work. I think it's work we need to continue with because one shot is not enough to deal with systemic racism. So um, I'm pleased to see we'll be talking about it again on the 21st. Thanks, Barbara. Well, uh, I want to talk about it on the 21st, too, but I have a statement that I want to submit in the record tonight. I've already sent it to Charlene. Okay, go ahead. All right, I'm going to read it. It's lengthy, uh, but I want it in the record, so that's why I'm reading it. Okay. <clears throat> At the OVU School Board September 23 training session, I objected rather vehemently to racial equity trainer Paul Gorski's characterization of William Julius Wilson's work as debunked and marginal. Because I expect that most other board members of the board were unfamiliar with what we were talking about, and because some appeared to believe that I was rudely interrupting for no reason, I want to explain what was at stake in this dispute. I'll start by explaining exactly who William Julius Wilson is. Professor Wilson is a Lewis P. and Linda L. Geyser University professor at Harvard. That is, he holds an endowed chair. He's been at Harvard since 1996. He's affiliated, he's, he's affiliated there with the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, and the Harvard Department of Sociology. Previously, he was director of the University of Chicago Center for the Study of Urban Inequality. He's a past president of the American Sociological Association. His 45 honorary degrees include doctorates from Yale, Princeton, Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, Northwestern, Johns Hopkins, 
NYU and Dartmouth. He was a MacArthur Fellow in 1987. That's the Genius Award. He was awarded the National Medal of Science, the highest scientific honor in the United States in 1998, and the W.B. Du Bois Career Distinguished Scholarship Award, the highest award bestowed by the American Sociological Association in 2014. His many other awards include the Martin Luther King Jr. National Award for the Southern, from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I'd add that Professor Wilson also happens to be African American. This is the man whose work Dr. Gorski told us is debunked and marginal. I submit that Dr. Gorski was arguing either from ignorance or in bad faith. In either case, that should alarm us and sees the expert that our superintendent is hiring to audit our entire school system on the subject of race. On completing the audit, you can be sure he will propose a radical revision of our curriculum. What's at stake here is not merely his blatantly wrong characterization of Professor Wilson's seminal work in American sociology, but what that work says, which is why Dr. Gorski would prefer you not know about it. Wilson has very strongly argued and his argument is based on impeccable social science research, that race is declining as a factor in American social life, including among African Americans, and has been for some time. Long-term trends bear out this assertion. Let me give you two quick examples. First, since the 1960s, tens of millions of African Americans have entered the middle class. Second, black college enrollment is up substantially in the 21st century. As of today, the percentage of African-American students at four-year public and private universities is nearly equivalent to the percentage of African-Americans in the U.S. population. It's also worth pointing out the obvious facts that in the last 20 years, we've had an African-American -Ameri African president, two-term president, a national African-American national security advisor, and an African-American secretary of state. An African-American son of the segregated Deep South sits on the Supreme Court. In other words, there's ample reason to believe that Professor Wilson is correct about the long-term declining significance of race in the United States, as well as about the economic causes of the problems of the group he's termed the truly disadvantaged, that's a quotation, that is poor urban African-Americans. Critical race theorists such as Dr. Gorski would prefer that you believe racism, racism is a permanent, unchanging blight on American culture that white Americans alone can be racist and no other race or ethnic group can be, that it is not enough for white Americans to treat people fairly and equally, but that whites must sign on to become actively, quote, anti-racist, unquote, and most importantly, that to be anti-racist, we must do what people like Dr. Gorski tell us to do. That is, we must leave it to them, to decide when we are sufficiently anti-racist and therefore good people. All theories of false consciousness presume that an enlightened elite should be able to tell everyone else what to do. Let me assure you, the people who work with their hands are never among that elite, nor is anyone who didn't go to college, nor is anyone who questions the presuppositions of that elite. Worst of all, the critical race theorists are preparing to tell the parents of our supervisory union that we parents must abdicate the moral education of our children when it comes to matters of race in favor of a curriculum designed by them. And if you're white and you haven't bought in, they're gonna teach your kids that you're the problem. Because they make false assumptions about American society, the critical race theorists are also profoundly wrong about American history. They make the claim most famously in the New York Times 1619 project that the arrival of the first African slaves in the Chesapeake that is what's now Virginia and Maryland, mark the true founding of America, that the American Revolution was fought to defend the institution of slavery, and that the history of white racism is the core of the American story. Let's test that assumption by examining the history of race in our district, that is our supervisory union. In 1777, the Vermont Constitution was the world's first to ban slavery. In December 1833, Orson Murray, a resident of Brandon, was one of the founding members of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Beriah Green, a former resident of Brandon at the time, 
was presided over the society's first convention. There were only 62 members of the society when it was founded. Two of them were from Brandon. The first meeting of the Brandon Anti-Slavery Society took place in January 1834. Not one, but two anti-slavery newspapers were published in Brandon, the first beginning in 1835. The Vermont Anti-Slavery Society held its annual convention in Brandon in 1837. In 1846, the African-American anti-slavery orator Henry Highland Garnett spoke in Brandon and he spent the night here. He was at least the second African-American anti-slavery orator to speak in town. The next day he spoke in Pittsburgh. It's highly likely that people in Brandon harbored escaped slaves. Brandon regularly elected Liberty Party men, anti-slavery Whigs, and anti-slavery Republicans to the state legislature beginning in the 1840s. The well-known abolitionist William Slade represented our district in Congress. 53 men from Brandon alone, mostly very young men, died in the Civil War. And I'd point out that the town's population in 1860 was just over 3,000, so almost 2% of our population. In 1880, Colonel John R. Lewis of the 5th Vermont Regiment, speaking in the Brandon Town Hall, addressing the Reunion Society of Vermont officers, denounced the atrocities of Southern Reconstruction and called upon his brother officers to fight it. I'm quoting him now. He says, by open intimidation, by disguised Ku Klux, by whipping, by murdering, by burning alive, they seek to keep freedmen from the polls. The half has never been told concerning the atrocities. On Memorial Day in 1886, Brandon dedicated its Civil War monument. Here are two short excerpts from the day's statements. The Great War of the Rebellion tore the manacles of bondage from millions of people and bade them go free. It raised them in the eyes of the law from the condition of chattel to that of free men. It lifted them from degradation and slavery to citizenship and sovereignty. That's quote one, here's the second one. The precious blood our men poured out established the supremacy of this government upon the eternal principles of right, equality, and justice. Unless our education incorporates those things, then we're doing our children wrong. This is the legacy of race and freedom that we should, but most definitely are not teaching our, our district's children. Thanks, that's the end of my statement. I just wanna make sure you're, you have finished your um, speech, Kevin. I didn't wanna interrupt. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Would anyone like to make a comment? I guess I have a point of order question. Okay. So in my time on the board, this is the first time that's happened. Um, I think that's all very interesting. I also think we're here to do the board's work and it's fine to enter that into the record, but we have an agenda and I'm wondering how much of our agendas are going to be taken over by um, lengthy statements by one of the board members. That's not our work. And I would direct board members to the policies in terms of how we operate as a board so that we can actually do the work we're here to do. Okay, any other comments? I, this is Bonnie. I, I guess my thought is I, I just don't understand how I just don't understand how that is is working with what we are doing this evening. I understand it was looked sounded like it was uh, perhaps well researched, had facts 
that the uh, board member wanted to present, but I just don't understand where it fits in this meeting tonight. Okay. All right. Um, hearing no other comments from anyone, uh, I allowed Kevin to speak um, because I feel it's important that everybody have their voice. So, um, but as far as the, um, his comments, um, they're in the record, it, it can be there. Um, but I think that we would pick up this conversation in two weeks when we actually talk about what we heard two weeks ago when we met with Mr. Gorski and I don't remember the other lady's name. Um, Marceline DuBose. Thank you. So does anybody uh, have an issue with that? Okay, so we're gonna move on then. Next thing on our agenda is the policy rehearsal. Uh, which is in your packet for the rehearsal worksheet uh, 2.8 communication support. Let me find it here. It also would be helpful to either go online or get your paper copy of the policies right. as you do this. So essentially what the, the rehearsal worksheet says is we have a scenario. Um, the district has received word that there was an error in the SBAC testing process and the results have been invalidated. The board read about this error in the media and is upset with the superintendent at the next board meeting because they did not have any advanced warning. To process this scenario, we want to walk through the following guiding questions individually and as a board. So the guiding questions are down below. There are four of them. Um, do we want to take a few minutes and um, do this alone and then pull it together and, and kind of pull it together as a board? So that you have a chance to look at your policies. Hey, Lori. Hey, do there. You, do you have the ability to do funky breakout sessions? Yes. Um, Jean does. Absolutely. You want to break out? Is that something I need to make yeah. a motion toward or can we just do that? I feel like that might be helpful. Sure, and then pull us all back together. So do a breakout session, um, three or four people in a group. Yeah, like 10 minutes. I don't know how much time you think we need, five yeah. minutes? Five yeah, minutes? I'd, I'd stay with five, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm okay. looking for my breakout ability. Huh, it changed things again. I'm gonna admit, to having had an earlier policy meeting that put me in mind of policy. And then I had a wonky friend here who helped me look through this. And so I'm all excited about policy now. I was gonna say, you look all excited about it. I know, I was gonna say, wow, you are like really upbeat. You'll never hear me say that again. <laughs> I, I don't quite understand why Breakouts aren't sitting right there for me. Mm. I am the host. It even says I'm the host. <laughs> but the breakout button it. doesn't exist. Oh no. Uh oh. So I don't know what to tell you. Let me check if it's down here. It's not under the participants thing. That's I'm checking. No. Polls, chat, share screen. Google it. Yeah, it must be a change in the, I will. Um, what I might do, well, no, I guess I can't sign out because I could lose you all, so I won't do that. Um, Oh, 
Oh, I think you have to do it beforehand. Yeah, but you don't have to set them up beforehand. Um, you just have to enable it, which it's enabled. That's what I was just checking. And then you can set it up at the moment. Um, so do you want to do something else in the meeting while I attempt to do this and come back to this item? I'm sure. If everyone else is okay with that. Unless sure. you need me for that. <laughs> um, well, we can discuss the next couple of things that are coming up that um, what the Barso board is doing um, that I'm assuming they've invited us to, which is their bias yeah. training. Yes, they aren't okay. actually doing it. Uh, Chittenden Select Board is. And you're okay. Invited. So are we invited to that? Yes. Okay. So the Chittenden Select Board is having a virtual training on implicit bias on October 22nd at 6.30. I'm, uh, it's virtual, so I'm assuming it's a Zoom meeting, and we are invited to attend that if we would like. Um, the Barsta Board is also having a virtual training on policy governance. So for those of you who, uh, is that with Susan? No, it's actually uh, with the Barsta Board. They've designed it. Ah, well, there we go. So it's board members doing it. Okay. So that might be interesting also for those of us that are new to policy governance or want to see how they do it. Um, no, that's on November 17th at 6 p.m. Uh, let's see. So we could go into the monitoring report while you're figuring out the breakout sessions. You mean the board monitoring report, that one? Yep. Yeah. Uh, the mo well, the mon your monitoring report that you've provided to us. Okay. Um, which is the executive limitations monitoring report. 2.8 communications and support to the board. Hopefully everybody, that was in your packet. Hopefully everybody had a chance to look at it. Um, are there questions, anything specific, anybody wants to mention about it? So you received the interpretation last week, right. last time. So now are there questions about it? Right. and. Um, what you'll see now is the observable conditions that she has and the evidence that she's providing and whether or not she reports compliance with the policy. The last time we went through each interpretation, um, just to give everybody a chance to kind of feel it out, what's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to do that again? I feel like um, it is possibly a really good exercise. Um, this is like, again, the, sure. I'm not the policy person, but um, getting everybody to feel more comfortable with how policy governance works. Uh, In the policies themselves. Yeah, it, uh, it, it really does involve the hard work of, of digging into these things so that we feel like we have a handle on how they um, enable us to do our job and enable Jean to do her job and define those roles, uh, which I feel is coming into a little bit of question here and there. So um, wanting people to believe in policy governance and see its strengths, um, I think is bolstered by conducting these exercises in depth. Okay. Everybody else feel the same way or at least um, enough to want to do that? Yeah. If, uh, if we're, you know, truly supposed to be taking this seriously, I mean, that's the role of the board. So we should be going through it every single piece. Okay. Perfect. All right. So then what I'm going to do is read the policy, which is, um, highlighted in bold. We're going to start with number one that says neglect two. Um, and then we will uh, discuss um, what you see there. I can, if you want, I will uh, certify, I'll read the certify, what she's certifying in her evidence and that she is reporting either compliance or non-compliance. And then we can talk about it. Sound good? Yep. Okay. So number one, Neglect to uh, 
the superintendent shall not cause or allow the board to be uninformed or unsupported in its work. Further, without limiting the scope of the foregoing by this enumeration, the superintendent shall not neglect to submit monitoring data required by the board, see policy 3.4 on monitoring superintendent performance in a timely, accurate, and understandable fashion, directly addressing the provisions of board policies being monitored. Uh, Gene certifies that the observable conditions are monitoring reports are scheduled by the board and placed on the work plan, and that interim reports may be requested by the board. Her evidence to support that is that the OVUU work plan did list due dates for five monitoring reports for the 1920 school year, and an interim report was requested in June of 2020. Her other observable condition is that the superintendent may provide a written report as requested or make evidence available for a direct inspection if so requested. And during the, her evidences during the 1920 school year, 2.1 and 2.4 were provided to the OVUU board and accepted. The reports are available on the OVUU board page. Minutes indicate the reports were read and accepted. Um, she notes that two other reports were unable to be completed due to school closure under COVID and the time needed to focus on a continu continu continuity, there we go, a learning plan. These reports were placed on the 2021 work plan Evidence was provided on the reports completed. Her last observable condition is that the superintendent may also bring information to the board that she feels is timely and necessary. The superintendent was asked to provide an interim report with the lens of COVID review of all executive limitation policies in June, and this was done and accepted. She reports compliance within the language of the policy. Discussion? If I may, I would add evidence that I just provided to you about IRS as additional evidence to bringing information to the board that I feel is timely and necessary. Yep. And I want to say thank you, Jean. In that communication, you were very clear about delineating several things that made it easier for us to know possible implications, um, other districts that may have been having similar problems, where the problem originated from and how it's being handled. Thank you for that. And, and I would also note on that particular one, I noted non-compliance in this particular instance. And with the non-compliance report, I am required to bring you a plan and timeline within which I will be in compliance. And will that uh, email be brought to public knowledge in this meeting or how would you- During, during the superintendent's report, Angela, I'll speak to it there. Okay. Here, Thank it's you. just an example of bringing information. Anyone else? I like that your um, your report is very detailed and that you are very specific as to your evidence. You're not just saying, yep, I did it. So I appreciate that. Yeah, that's an evolution as well that came from last fall's training on how to identify what observable conditions would look like and what the evidence is. And just to remind the board, at any point, you could also choose when you're putting um, monitoring reports on your work plan, you could choose for something to be a direct inspection. Um, that's often used for financial sections. Um, so it doesn't just have to be the superintendent saying so. Great. Yeah, I would just add to working with a number of superintendents. I think, I think we are as well informed as any group that I've ever been a part of. So I thank you for that, Jean. Thank you. Okay, number two is that the superintendent shall not allow the board to be unaware of any actual or anticipated noncompliance with any ends or executive limitations policy, regardless of the board's monitoring schedule. So um, observable conditions, superintendents monitoring reports and interim informational communications will truthfully and accurately 
alert the board to any condition of current noncompliance or condition of noncompliance considered likely in the future and should include a plan for incremental movement toward compliance in a reasonable time frame. I just said that. <laughs> you did. Um, evidence is during the 1920 school year, 2.1 and 2.4 were provided to the OVUU board and accepted. These reports are available on the Otter Valley Unified Union Board page. Minutes indicate the reports were read and accepted. An interim report also spoke to noncompliance, such as the impact of COVID-19 on the budget for the district in spring 2020, as well as a change in the signing orders for the duration. The plan was discussed and approved. Um, each board meeting gets a superintendent update with information for a variety of purposes. These reports are also used to report noncompliance or to follow up on compliance issues. For example, the message on a confidentiality protocol was identified in the fall of 2019. State financial impact on the budget was provided in May 2020. Again, Gene reports compliance in this particular policy. Discussion? Okay, so again, we spoke to this before. Um, this is actually very timely because of the um, communication that she sent out regarding the IRS issue that uh, we'll be, she'll be talking about later on. But again, even before the monitoring report, she let us know um, immediately as soon as she knew. And um, I think that uh, is good evidence to show that she's um, providing us with the information that we need to make timely decisions. All right, not hearing anything, we'll continue going on. Number three, the superintendent shall not neglect to submit unbiased decision information required periodically by the board or let the board be unaware of relevant trends. Observable conditions is that the superintendent will provide unbiased factual information and or data for board decisions and provide relevant information to the board regarding any trends that may affect progress towards achieving the identified global ends of the district. Her evidence includes monthly superintendent reports, which indicate information for board decisions and trends. The periodic off schedule communications, um, including legislative updates and data provided during budget proposal discussions, including enrollment projection. She again reports compliance. Discussion. The other thing I, um, I was just gonna say was that um, when we're going through this and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone with pol more policy governance training than myself, these are the policies, the one, two, three, whatever. And so if we feel that, you know, that, that these are not what it, we want them to be, then we can change them, whether making them more restrictive or um, not as, you know, if they're not, doing what exactly we want as a board from Jean. Uh, Greg, you have your hand up. Sorry, I don't. Greg. Well, if Greg, if you do have a question, um, just shout it out. Can you hear me? Yep, now I can. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, if we ever have a policy that we wanna change or add to, does, does it require it being on the agenda? And if it does, does it have to be two board meetings or can it happen in one board meeting? So I would suggest that um, if there's a change that we want to make, that we indicate it um, when we're talking about these. Um, the RNESU board actually um, went through a policy last month, and we determined that there's a couple of changes that we want to make, um, but we're not going to actually talk about those changes until our next board meeting. So they should be warned. Um, and then from there, 
it may take two meetings to actually approve it and make it part of our policies. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Thanks. Yep. But this is now is the time to make it known so that we can, you know, put it on the next agenda or so that we don't allow it to go another year, six months or whatever, if it's not something that we like. Wasn't wasn't there when we did the first reading, didn't we have a few things that we did want to change? And is there any record of that anywhere? No. Um, Angela, I think that um, there was discussion about a change in the meeting you had at the high school, but no motion was brought forward, no, no action was taken. I don't recall discussion during the interpretation reading of the, but if so, it, it, it was. Well, it's because, yeah. it's because we were shut down and said that we couldn't do it at that time. We had to wait until another time. So, oh. but Lori is telling us that t tonight's the time. Mm -hmm. So well, that's why I'm. Curious to what this particular policy, you know, if you see something, then we should we should talk about it and so that we can bring it forth to our next board meeting. As you go through each section. Right. Okay. I'm not hearing anything, so I'm gonna continue on. Stop me if I'm going too fast. Number four. The superintendent shall not let the board be unaware of any significant incidental information it requires, including anticipated media coverage, threatened or pending lawsuits, and material internal and external changes. Her observable conditions are that the superintendent provides the board with current incidental information, ensures that the board is not uninformed or surprised when unusual events occur as soon as reasonably as possible. It includes anticipated media coverage, which is not recurring, legal proceedings and information the board as a whole request from the superintendent. Her evidence is her superintendent reports, interim media alert and incident emails, calls to the board chair should a legal proceeding exist, agendas identifying uh, matters of importance, and executive sessions such as personnel issues, negotiations, and student issues. She reports compliance. Discussion with for anyone? Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. I, I found this one, number four, to be uh, really the essence of the, um, the rehearsal activity um, and really dealing with, um, you know, the, the incidental information, um, particularly ones that relate to media uh, media information that we get a heads up on it um, so that we're not surprised. Um, I found it, you know, to be very clear and helpful when I was reviewing that rehearsal activity. Great. Excellent. Other comments, questions? Okay, thanks, Derek. Number five, uh, that the superintendent shall not let the board be unaware if, in the superintendent's opinion, the board is not in compliance with its own policies on governance process and board's management delegation, particularly in the case of board behavior that is detrimental to the work relationship between the board and the superintendent. Observable conditions, superintendent brings matters to the board's attention that in her opinion indicates board behavior which is out of compliance with board policies. Her evidence is that this has occasionally happened most recently as the board discussed the operational response to COVID school closure and reopening, but for the most part, it has not been an issue and the board lives within the policies and identified role, of its identified roles and responsibilities. Barbara. Oh, and she reports compliance. Yes. Hmm. This one is very intriguing to me. <clears throat> okay. Where to begin? I think we are not in compliance with this. I'm not or you're not? I think, well, hmm, right. I think you should be telling us we're not in compliance more than you are. 
uh, honestly, because I think we're not, I think we're doing some things that uh, need checking. So yeah, it's interesting when I was reading this going, I think she needs to, she may have to, um, you may need to notify us of non-compliance. Is that the is that the true feeling of the whole board, or is that just your opinion? It's mine. It's only mine. I'm speaking for myself. I just when I read that, I thought, yeah, I think this is a, probably a problem. That's, um, yeah. Um, Derek, go ahead. I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, I'd like to back up from the observable conditions and evidence box to the to the uh, paragraph before that. Okay. For the last sentence, it says, this policy allows the superintendent to be a partner with the board in monitoring actions that may interfere with the policy set out by the board without fear of retaliation. In fact, the superintendent is mandated to speak up if he knows the board entering into the area of superintendent responsibilities in particular. Um, I think that that's really clear in terms of helping guide our role as a board uh, to steer clear of operations uh, kinds of uh, activities and uh, and stay with you know forward thinking and future looking and uh, larger picture issues. Okay. Um, Bonnie, you have your hand. Bonnie Bourne, you have your hand raised. Yes, I, I do think I do think we slip into areas that aren't ours to tread in. I think I think um, I think that's what Barbara was saying, and I would agree that if we're headed that way and we're not bringing ourselves back to our legitimate role, then I think it is Jean's not only her right but her responsibility to to guide us back to what is our legitimate uh, what is our legitimate role in this entity. And as Derek says, it's the, it's the big picture stuff. It's the visioning and setting goals and uh, trying to move the organizational forward in organization forward in a way that most benefits uh, all of our kids. So um, I am really agreeing with what Barbara's saying. I, I, I don't think we're obnoxious about it, but I do think we slide into it more frequently than we should. So I'm going to take some um, of the heat for that only because during each board meeting, if someone has questions, I do allow them to speak because I think it's important that we hear everyone's voice. And then I also hope that board members um, will also help with the policy governance um, and the fact that we are not supposed to be in operations so that, um, but sometimes we, you know, we have to have the discussion in order to to help everybody along and make sure that we're always big picture thinking. So I, I, I no, I just, I will apologize if, if I've allowed you to, to go too far into the other way. So um, Barbara, your hand went up first and then Bonnie Bourne. Sorry, because I started to interrupt you and I apologize. Um, it's okay. Uh, but rats. Oh, I know. Um, I concur that we, you know, discussing things and working them out. I, we're still in these early stages of being in policy governance. We have new members coming onto the board who may not be familiar with it. So if we need to talk things over to get everybody to understand that, you know, the board, whoever was on the board at the time, spent two, three, maybe even more years um, investigating, researching policy governance, going to trainings, you know, this was a very well thought out decision, then that work needs to be done so that everyone understands how this works. Um, and that we all are working together within policy governance to do the job we're called to do. Um, and as long as those discussions are happening in good faith, I think that we're okay. I get worried when I think that that might not always be the case, and I want us to check ourselves. Um, okay, Bonnie, you're next, and then Kevin, and then Becky. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing. I don't, I don't see anything that puts policy governance in a board member, um, ex, you know, making a statement or, or exercising their voice. I don't think those are in conflict. I think what we need to remember is that, if, you know, if I'm expressing something that I feel and I'm, and I'm speaking to something, then it's just me. It's, it's Bonnie Bourne, one board member. It, it's not the whole board. So um, I, I don't know that there's necessarily any need for anyone to apologize for any of this. I think we're just uh, getting uh, better and better at understanding what is the legitimate role of a school board uh, in the state of Vermont. And there, many of us would like it to be something other than what it is. But the reality is that we are a policy making body and that's where we should spend most of our time. Did we lose Lori? Lori, you're muted. Oh, now you're. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? It's okay. Yeah. It's, a, it's your turn. Who? Kevin, right? Yep. Oh. Thanks, Lori. Um, yep. Well, I have some sympathy with Barbara's earlier statement that, that uh, uh, long meetings can be uh, tedious, but. Um, I think it's really important that we talk about what we need to talk about and using the idea of policy governance as a kind of muzzle for people such as myself, I, I think is not a good idea. Uh, and the, the other thing is that this, uh, I'd point out that once again, we're spending the majority of our meeting talking about our own governance, um, our own process. and. It seems like that's all we've done since I've been on the board. You know, I, and I've been on here for a year now, coming up in, uh, in, in March. We haven't talked once about our abysmal test scores in this district, not once as a board. So, you know, when Derek talks about we have to be looking toward the future, that's, that's great. I'm not sure how looking for the future intersects with operations. Because if we're talking about the future, aren't we talking about future operations? Doesn't that make it an operational discussion? I think this is artificial distinction we're trying to draw here between the board is this, you know, the grand poobahs of education who, you know, think about the future in big grand terms all the time while, you know, the school uh, runs around uh, as a kind of entity unto itself that has nothing, you know, the actual doings of our educational system have nothing to do with us. It's, it's a crazy distinction, a false one. So, that's my two cents. Sorry if I went on along too long, Barbara. You're muted, Lori. I think Rebecca's next, if you're going by hands, but it's not my right. Sorry, um, I had to step away. Becky's next. Um, a couple of things. I just wanted to say that I agree with Barbara and Bonnie. And I think maybe one way that we can, as a board, be better at it is when, um, you know, there's questions or we're veering, we think we're veering off to A, say it, but then also pull out our book um, and those of us who have had more training and say, hmm, here's the policy. Does it you know, is it agreeing with it or not? So we, we as a board can also be better um, at using our policies to help with that. So we can move on through these discussions instead of, um, you know, either continuing to go down the, the rabbit hole or um, off track. Great. Uh, I'm gonna let Greg go first because he hasn't really had a chance to speak and then Barbara will come back to you if that's okay. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Am I there? Oh, good. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I don't know where to begin. Um, <laughs> I sort of feel like I understand what a lot of people are, are saying here. Um, I don't think that... Um, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, 
I don't think that we want to go back to doing any sort of operations. I don't think that that would be the best thing to do. I think policy governance is a great thing, but um, I do think that the thing we're missing, and I think Lori's trying to get there a little bit, which is to get the voices of people heard and um, to come to a consensus, um, you know, of what as any issue that comes up, if there's a feeling by certain board members that this actually should involve the board, I think we should have a discussion and possibly a vote, and not just have one person's voice say it is policy governance, somebody else say it isn't, and then we're nowhere. I just, I think it would be easier to just come to a consensus on those things. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Barbara. So let's see. Um, uh, I want to address a couple of the things you brought up, Kevin. I'm not suggesting we muzzle you. I'm suggesting that for the record, you can submit as long of a thing as you wish, but the board's time is the board's time. And a lot of the detail in your statement was maybe not necessary for you getting your point across. Um, and that's maybe not the best use of our time and especially when we actually do have policies about that govern that specific behavior that's what i'm talking about secondly i'm certainly not suggesting that we muzzle you um everybody can you know say what they need to say and we can we should hammer out i i do agree we have to hammer this out so we can come up with something that resembles unified um, a unified board position um, the reason we spend a lot of time on policy governance is because that's how it operates that's what we do um, we don't get in the weeds of um, i mean we do look at trends and test scores but it is on an agenda and it's part of the overall policies that we use to do our job and we then turn it over to Jean and her team and they do their job. And if we feel they're not in compliance with some of the policies we've set, we have to visit that as the board. We all care about that, but this is how we govern. And so that's what you signed on for when you joined the board. And I'm, we're trying to get everybody up to speed so that we can, you know, um, govern as a unified board. So I hope that is going to help with the clarification. A lot of this talking and processing is stuff is work that the board just has to do because we are early in the stages of um, writing these policies and evaluating and going through the motions. It's really time consuming um, when you're a board that's new to policy governance. It just takes a long time. It's what I have heard in all these different trainings, once you are up to speed, it becomes a lot easier um, and quicker. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I know that um, Jean and Lori and Rebecca have done quite a bit of training on this. And I think that's, if memory serves, that's kind of how it goes. It's, it's time consuming, but it's um, important so we can do the good work that we're here to do. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Angela, you have your hand up. Lori, could I get on the list after Angela? I don't have a hand to raise. Oh, too bad. Um, but yes, Angela, go ahead and then we'll let Jean speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. So um, I kind of missed a lot of what everybody said, so I apologize if I'm gonna repeat anything. Um, my internet was going in and out. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think Jean is doing a great job at shutting us down when she needs to and, and giving us the flexibility to speak well, when she feels, uh, or I don't even know if it's how she feels, but when um, the board needs to have a discussion and maybe it isn't policy governance and it isn't following it, but um we need to like have the discussion to kind of know where what 
the issue really is. It's kind of, it's like a, it's like a balancing act, I think, for her to, to try and, you know, play both roles. Um, I, I think it's hard for a lot of us, even myself, to, to do this board governance. And I find it would be nice if when we do get into discussions and somebody does feel like we're going off the rails, if there's a way to pull us back and say, to address this issue, we should look at policy this or policy that, and maybe we can make changes to this policy or that policy to address this issue instead of just shutting us down. Um, I think, I think <laughs> trying to use policy governance and to steer our conversations is a better way to hear everybody and still try and bring it back to a policy. I hope that makes sense. That's all I have for right now. Thank you, Angela. Um, Jean, your turn. Okay, a couple of things. Thank you. Um, on the topic of test scores, uh, you're correct. You haven't had a report on that since you came on the board, Kevin, and that's because it's usually done in the spring, um, and we didn't really have a spring. So that hasn't occurred. Um, it is actually to be built into the monitoring report for your global ends policy, because that is part of the global ends, which is focused on student achievement. Test scores are part of that. Um, and you haven't had a full global ends report either, as you just revised it in November and it wasn't on the work plan to do that. So that can be revisited as to when's the best time to do that. And I don't have an answer to that question right now since we're still living in this weird world. I can tell you, and I did tell you in my superintendent's report that we're doing diagnostic testing of all of our students right now. And so in a future incidental report, I will probably give you an update on, on how that's going. So at least you know that. Um, secondly, um, I'll, I would point out that um, this is a fabulous discussion. And I appreciate Angela bringing it back to the policy in front of you that you're actually um, commenting on right now. Um, and I think walking through, as, as Eric said, walking through these nine pieces, is it nine or 11, I forget, will help you as you do the scenario, or maybe this is your practice for tonight as opposed to the scenario because it's taking time. Um, but I do think that it's hugely important that you walk through each one of these and have the kind of discussion you had, where do you see this happening? This says that I can bring to your attention if I feel like you're veering off, my operations have to be following your direction. So you hire me to do the operations, but you set the direction in your global ends and, and your policies. And you are my boss. So I can tell you if I think that you're off track and you can choose to be off track anyway and it's not like I can do anything about that. But I think as Angela said, it's, it's a balance between um, me letting you know we're going off track for the policies and then you the board as a whole deciding whether you want to continue going off track, which is your prerogative um, or if it, if it brings us back in. So I hope that helps. Thank you. All right, so we've had a lot of lively discussion. Um, um, so I'm ready to move to number six, unless you feel that we need to continue to discuss this. I think what we're learning from all of this is that even though there's lots of us who know policy governance and some of us that don't, that we're finding our way and that we, you know, we, I can't think of a time when we've all started bringing our policies to every meeting. I think you're gonna find that we're gonna start doing that um, so that as conversations happen, we can make sure that we're talking about our policies and not getting into the weeds um, and operations, which is Jean's purview. So is everybody okay with that? I would just uh, oh. Uh, oh yeah I see Bill's hand is up. Yeah. 
Bill, if you could unmute. Bill, you're still muted. There you go. Bill, can you say something so I know you're there? You're unmuted, Bill, if you want to just talk. I'm not hearing you. Too. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep going, but Bill, if you can get your um, microphone to work, jump in at any time. Hey, Lori, can I say one thing before we move on? Was your hand yeah. raised? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you're going to move on, and I don't want you to move yeah. on. No. Um, in, because I missed half of the discussion, is there anything that was discussed that needs to be changed in this section? Does anybody feel that we need to make any changes? I guess this is a question that should be asked. Okay. Good question. I didn't hear anything specifically that said we needed to change it. I think it, our discussion was pretty much uh, around the fact that we were trying to understand it and make it all work for us um, as a board. But if I'm incorrect, please correct me. And um, otherwise we will continue on to number six. Okay. Um, the superintendent shall not present information in unnecessarily complex or lengthy form or in a form that fails to differentiate among information of three types, monitoring, decision preparation, and incidental. Her observable conditions are that the superintendent shall provide reports to the boards for monitoring, actionable, and incidental purposes in a timely manner. Her evidence is her monthly superintendent updates with board agendas and her interim emails on incidental or media issues. She reports compliance. Any discussion? Yeah, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, um, I think it's important to I need to work on understanding these three different types of information, the, uh, the monitoring, the decision preparation and, and, uh, and incidental stuff. Cause, um, in, in traditional board work versus policy governance, it's a lot of, a lot of it is about, um, decision-making and the board's always making the decisions. Um, but in policy governance, our policies have really delegated a tremendous amount to the superintendent to oversee and implement and and hold people accountable um and i think that's that's an area that that's a pitfall for us um in in understanding the differences and trying to keep from trying to trying to be the decision maker, but yet it's complicated because we need information and, and we do have responsibilities to make some decisions. Um, I don't know, I just, I just find it an area of, of, that I need to work on to understand those, the differences of, of those kinds of information. Sure. It's not all, it's not all one uh, kind of information. <laughs> okay. Well, and we can work on that as far as, I mean, we could do a, a training if everyone wanted to do that as far as the differences in um, the different kind of information. Monitoring is obviously going to be in the monitoring reports and the incidental stuff is usually all the stuff she tells us in her superintendent report, which is not something that we would actually have an actionable action on. And then the decision stuff is usually stuff that's in statute that we have to make a motion and, and, and pass. And the superintendent's report often has all three of those things in there. Not so much monitoring as much, but um, I'll identify them. Is this informational or is this 
action. And if it's action, it's usually related to either an agenda item that's a vote or a consent agenda item that gives you the background information that you need for it. So that's really what the action is about. What information do you need to make your decision? But uh, using Kevin's uh, concern about um, test scores as an example, um, I get a sense, Kevin, uh, talking to you directly, that, that you wanted to uh, have the board uh, have a say in um, in actions around improving test scores um, and, and dig into it and find out why and, and make recommendations about what we should be, do, uh, you know, and, and do something. Um, and I have to say that, that I don't see that as the board's role. I see that as Jean's responsibility to dig into that and maybe give us some answers like she does periodically um, you know, we had information about the, what is it, the Edmonton uh, program of, uh, of assessment and, and how does that relate to SBAC and is it valid or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, give us some information about, about that. Uh, we can hold her accountable uh, for poor test scores, um, but uh, you know, she needs to go out to her, you know, curriculum people and out to her faculty and, and look at uh, w what's going on in terms of practices. Uh, that's not what we do. Um, just for, that's my understanding. Anyway. Thank you, Derek. Um, Kevin, you had your hand up and then Bonnie, you're after him. Yes, again. Um, uh, I guess I want to respond to what Derek just said first. Uh, something like test scores is an example, or just, let's say low student performance, it's a more general term. I don't think that's something we should talk about once a year when it's, you know, the day that the policy for test, and test scores fall under, uh, it comes up. I think it's something we should talk about every meeting. Uh, and the idea that you kind of have to wait, you know, six months, seven months to hear about something that's critically important to our students, it seems to me we're abandoning our duty if we say, oh, well, you know, we'll wait until the meeting that's supposed to, blah, 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 that's supposed to happen. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's, a, I think that's a, a big problem with the way we're doing things. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, which was, was way back to the what we're talking about uh, with uh, this particular policy is I sympathize with your confusion about the terminology here. And you said, well, it's something I need to work on more. I don't think so. I don't think it's your fault, Derek. I think that one of the major problems with this whole situation is this terrible bureaucratic language this is written in. I mean, I don't know where we borrowed this stuff from, but you know, actionable isn't even a word. So, it's, it's this constant fog of vague terms and, and bureaucraties and, and, you know, business speak. And, uh, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but when I, you know, close this meeting after tonight, and I, or maybe three days from now, if I choose to go look at these policies, they're going to be meaningless to me. And I, I'm an educated guy. I think I can read pretty well. But these things are so, it's, it's just a soup of, of, of vague uh, jargon. And uh, I don't see, even if we, I don't buy into the policy governance idea at all, as you may be surprised to hear, but even if I did, I would say these policies are terrible. They're, they're, they're impossible to understand. So that's why I would say we go around in circles and why you don't understand some of these distinctions, Derek. It's not you, it's, it's that these distinctions are, are, are made of fog. Okay, that's it for that, thank you. I think that um, you might be happier somewhere else, Kevin, um, because um, I believe in policy governance. I don't believe it's a fog. I believe it's a, it's a different model of decision-making and it's not micromanaging. It's not stepping on people's toes. It's not uh, uh, ignoring boundaries. Uh, I think it's, I think it's valuable and I think it's, 
a good worthwhile activity to understand the vocabulary. We're talking about systems change here. And for systems change to work, you need to have a common conceptual framework that everybody understands and you need to have a common vocabulary so that you can talk to each other. And that's what we're trying to do and that's why we're spending the time on these activities. Okay, um, Bonnie? Yeah, I, I, um, I too don't see these policies as being, as being fog. Um, they're certainly different from from the way that perhaps boards operated um, on, you know, once upon a time, or maybe some, some still do. The biggest benefit, and I want to follow up on something that Derek said, the biggest benefit I see to policy governance is that it keeps us in the appropriate, uh, it keeps us in the appropriate environment. We're a lay board. Um, we don't have the expertise to tell Gene how to raise test scores. I don't know how many of us sitting here, but I'm guessing most of us aren't experts on reading programs, math programs, poverty and learning, a million different things that impact student achievement. Our goal is to say to Gene, Gene, we want a really good school system where all of our kids are being successful. You and your team, who are the people that have the expertise to know how to do that, need to go off and do that work. There is, a, there is a lot of time and learning that has to go into understanding policy governance. And we've been at it, those of us that have been on the board for a number of years, for a long time. There are still places where every month I check myself on what does that mean? What do I think? Um, but I see us in a much more uh, proactive place than we were five or six years ago when we were going around in circles about where we were going to get the snow tires for the buses. That's not our bailiwick. That isn't where we should be spending our time. I think, Derek, you, you, you said it really well when you said it takes a commitment to understand this process, but it does give us a common language. It gives us a common language to go about helping Jean and her team, supporting them to build a better school system. Um, and I keep coming back to this, and I know some people think it's trite, Legally in the state of Vermont, that is our obligation. School boards are, po are, are governance bodies. They spo they're supposed to stay at the policy level. They have no authority to work in day-to-day -day operations of school systems. Um, so I, I think, you know, it took us a long time to make this decision. I'm not at all regretting the decision that we made, but it does take a commitment. And um, I can't say that I'm that I make it every single month, but I try and read my policies over most every single month and figure out how they fit into what's on the agenda at any give, for any given meeting. Lori, before you move on, could I point out that we are no longer on the monitoring report and we're back into a yes or no on policy governance? Yeah, I was well. I was going to ask Barbara or Kevin if this, if their comments were going to be based on the monitoring reports or, or continue about policy governance because we are. It's already quarter after seven. I don't want to stop anyone's conversation in the middle, but I do want to get us back on board um, because I think we're going to end up um, not being able to finish the work that's on our agenda for tonight um, because. Uh, after eight o'clock, we would have to have someone make a motion to move, uh, allow us to continue on to finish the process. Um, and I, I love the discussion about policy governance. It obviously shows that we're all thinking about it, how it works for us. Um, so we obviously need more time to process that, um, more policy governance, professional development, more, just more getting into this. I mean, we don't need to do the policy rehearsal that was on our agenda because we've actually just done it um, in real life. So um, I'm going to ask Barbara and Kevin if they have something to add that's different from the discussion that's already been had or if it's about the monitoring report. This is Comments remain to the report. Okay. And uh, Barbara, I didn't hear you. I, um... My, mine is in response to a couple of questions, comments that were made. Okay, well, if in the essence of time, I, I'll allow, you know, 
it's up to you if you've um maybe that's quick the the language jargon question um maybe we need to look at the language fix some okay. of that um I, I think it got brought up but like test scores if we talked about them every month we still can't do anything as a board other than put a lot of pressure on so i'm not sure what we would be doing differently i think we hear about them more than just once a year but we should have heard them about them in the spring and didn't because of COVID. so that was a clarification although i'm not sure i'm accurate on that and i'm yeah and that that's about it okay um as far as test scores goes i'm just gonna um and gene correct me if i'm wrong um you're gonna be talking about the enemy Edmonton scores. Yeah. It's new. We were we had been doing something else last year. I think you've moved into these new ones. But um, we should be hearing about those test scores at least three times. They are given to the kids at least three times throughout the year, um, mm -hmm. so that we can assess where they are and or where you excuse me, yeah. you can assess where they are and we get to find out some information about that. So and we'll be hearing about some of that tonight. Kevin, go ahead. So I would just quickly like to urge everyone to read a document such as the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of the State of Vermont, 1777 version, and then go read this immediately and you'll see the difference in clarity, in conciseness, in, um, in language. Uh, it, we're relying on a document that is is you know made of sand and and that leads to these circular discussions okay thanks okay thank you kevin okay i'm going to bring us back into um oh i would if i could have that email in front of me uh crap can someone go on to number i think we were on number six or seven does someone yeah. want to read it while well, I pull it back up, I lost it. Number seven says the superintendent shall not allow the board to be deprived of a workable mechanism for official board officer or community or committee communications. The observable conditions are, is that I maintain an email list and website where board information is shared, accessible, and communication is accessible. The evidence every board member has an email address for RNESU. The RNESU.org website has a board page with full agendas, meeting packets, news archives, policies, and other information the board may need to do its work. Financial reports are placed on the web monthly, now anyway. Virtual meetings are accessible by phone as well as internet. That's, that's reports compliance. Great. Any discussion? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on because I'm. everyone must agree with it then. So number eight, um, superintendent will uh, not deal with the board in a way that favors or privileges certain board members over others, except when responding to officers or committees duly charged by the board. Observable conditions, the superintendent shares information broadly with all board members. When questions arise or information is needed, those are um, evidenced by her emails to the board and to her monthly updated reports. The other observable condition is that the superintendent asks for clarification. If a board member makes a request to determine if the request is that of the board as a whole or just one person and evidence of that is in meetings. Um, she shows an example of September 3rd, 2020 when what clarification is requested as to the board direction to the superintendent. She reports compliance. Uh, Kevin, you have your hand raised? Or is that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. I just want to point out that when we're, we're silent, that does not, necessarily, does not necessarily mean that everybody agrees. There are other possible reasons for, for silence. Right, you are right. I apologize. Um, I just assume that that means I can continue on. Uh, Derek, yes, your hand is up. Um, I'd just like to add, um, in terms of evidence, that uh, Jean has been um, supportive of the uh, the Hawk Hill Committee and, and the work that, that we've been doing, and she's monitored 
our our work, and um, and has at times um, helped redirect me in in terms of my role as the chair of that committee, and uh, and kind of we you know we'd get lost in the weeds and and, and do some discussions uh, that were uh, through email and, and that developed into lengthy discussions uh, that you know should have happened at a a formally warned meeting and, and such. So, so I appreciate that kind of heads up uh, in terms of monitoring for, you know, appropriate board behavior and whatnot. So thanks. Thank you, Derek. Okay. Anything else? All right. Number nine. nine. Uh, the superintendent does, shall not allow the board to do its work without the necessary items on its consent agenda. Necessary items are those decisions delegated to the superintendent, yet required by law, regulation, or contract to be board approved, along with applicable monitoring reports. Observable conditions are that the superintendent uses the consent agenda to include items that fulfill the board's legal, contractual, and regulatory responsibilities. And the evidence is her is the consent agendas themselves and the monthly superintendent reports that include information on the consent agenda items. She reports compliance. Discussion. Uh, yep, Derek. I think um, I think it's important to note that using the consent agenda format um, saves a lot of time, um, but it also requires that we as board members do our homework and, and make sure that we know what's in there before the meeting and before we're asked to approve the consent agenda, uh, because there's often a lot of stuff in there. And I think that um, it's our responsibility to make sure we're aware of, of that and 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 make the necessary request to pull something off the, re, the consent agenda so that we can talk about it. Um, um, that's true because once the um, there is no discussion regarding consent agenda, so it's not like we can um, once it's been um, uh, approved and well not approved, but once it's been moved and seconded, there is no discussion. We just go immediately to vote. So. Yeah, That's why it's important to let me know before we get there that if there's something you want to pull off or whatever. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's a useful tool for e efficient meetings. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that it's not abused in terms of stuffing decisions into a consent agenda so we don't have to talk about it and it just goes through. Um, you know, we need to, it's our job to monitor that collection of items that we just say, yeah, go for it. Um, Evan? I feel obliged to let you know that something I want to pull off the consent agenda later. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's see. All right, number 10. Uh, the superintendent shall not allow the boards to be unaware of common concerns needs or issues and opportunities to collaborate. Her observable conditions are that the superintendent informs the board of community concerns or superintendent concerns. The evidence is her uh, superintendent monthly updates, interim emails between board meetings, um, opportunities to collaborate with other boards or other municipalities is shared. Um, uh, examples are the recent PD by the OVU board on equity. Uh, we shared that with Two other boards, um, Deb Zingheiser and Jean presented to the Essex Westford board. Um, OVUU collaborated on a resolution to the S VSBA with Essex Westford board. And we recently signed on to the anti-vaping lawsuit, which is um, lots of other boards have done. And she reports compliance. Questions? Discussion? Kevin? And then Derek. I don't know what PD stands for. Professional development. Thank you. You're welcome. Derek? Um, a, a, another opportunity, again, uh, was for um, the Hawk Hill Committee to, to collaborate with uh, the Brandon Greenways group and, um, 
as they were developing their their local history walks uh, and such, and and including a, a trail map of of the Hawk Hill area as part of their new uh, rollout brochure. Um, so it was a good experience, I think, in, in terms of an opportunity for the municipalities, plural, to collaborate. Great. Barbara, I see you um, opening up something. I'm assuming that's the Greenways. Yes, it is. Perfect. Right. So if anybody needs one, Barbara has it in her shop at the bookstore. And can I just add on that note, I took the kids hiking on the Hawk Hill trails and kudos to Hawk Hill people for excellent signage and beautiful trails. And first time I'd been there, okay, maybe ever. So that's a beautiful resource. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. I thank you. Excellent. All right, number 11. The superintendent shall not allow the board to be uninformed in a timely manner of all significant <laughs> gifts. Um, observable conditions is that the superintendent advises the board of all gifts and donations valued over $5,000. Evidence there have not been any donations or gifts received over that uh, 5000 in the past year. And admin memo K1516001P whew, guide as uh, the rest of the receipt of lesser gifts. She reports compliance. Hand up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yep. Go for it, Angela. Um, so this is one of the areas that we wanted to look at and we wanted to change the, the value of that. So can we make a note and bring it up at the next meeting? So actually, um, yes, we can. Although I would tell you that the interpretation is the one that we would um, so, w yeah, I guess we would be changing the, uh, well, the idea of what is significant because right. the, her interpretation that that means over $5,000, it's not necessarily right. us saying it's fi anything over 5000 And it looks like the interpretation was cut off from the last report I gave you, but it is based on something valid. So I think the way it would work, Angela, is if you don't want it to be $5,000, then you can revise policy 11 that or 2.1.11, whatever it is, and put an amount in there that you unidentified. That's what you would, that's how you would um, re refine it, revise it. Okay. okay, can we add that to an agenda sometime? Or yep, sometime I'm, soon? That, is that what the board wants to do? So, um, let's do this. Uh, we have this beautiful green and red thing. Um, so all of those that would like to see us put it on the agenda to potentially change um, policy number 11, press the green button. Those of you who do not um, want to do that, press your red button. So is a motion required? I don't I no, want... not really. I, the mo I, I don't think so. The motion that would be required is to actually approve the, to make the change. I think that we can just go by consensus if we think we want to. Yeah, because you're not deciding the answer. We're not deciding what it is tonight. An agenda item. Yeah. So I'm only seeing two people that are saying green and nobody with red. So at this, okay. oh, there's some reds. Oh, I sorry. You might be a tie. It might be. Does that mean I get to break it? Yep. Oh my. Can't see it because of all those stupid things are up. So if it's I a tie, it. it's a tie. Okay. Yeah. So then this is what I'm going to do in this particular instance. Um, because it's a tie and because I think it would be good for us to play around with one, I'm going to put this on the next um, agenda, not um, the one in two weeks, but our October, our, our November meeting. Um, and this will give us, instead of um, doing doesn't a look like it's a tie we'll anymore. Actually, what? I'm sorry. Looks like it's five green and four red that I'm counting. No, it's five and five. Well, if it's then if it's five green, then it's still going to be on our um, yeah it's agenda. Five so and you and you are voting yes. So okay, 
So then we will put it on the agenda for uh, the first Wednesday in November and you will see it on our, um, on the agenda. And so we will not have a policy rehearsal that night because we're going to actually be working with our policies and that will be our rehearsal. And okay. Okay. So number 12 says the superintendent shall not allow the board to be unsupported and uninformed in its role as a quasi judicial hearing body. So observable conditions is that the superintendent provides timeline information and legal support if needed during quasi judicial hearings. Um, the evidence is that the OVU board has not had a quasi judicial hearing in the last year. For those people who don't know what quasi-judicial hearings are, it's um, if something, uh, negotiations comes to the, if there's a personnel matter that uh, is brought forth to the board, that is where we are the quasi-judicial board. And Jean tells us her side of the story, the uh, employee would tell us their side of the story, and then we get to make the final decision, correct? Okay. So, and we haven't had to do that in the last year. So she's reporting compliance. And that was the last one. Okay. So any overarching comments about this monitoring report? This is what we're gonna be doing every other month. Uh, we'll be having a different monitoring report on a different executive limitation from Jean and um, this is kind of the, what we'll go through. This is the process. All right. Uh, let's see, we are going to skip the next one, which is the monitoring report for 4.2, which was our board job description um, in the essence of time, because it's 735. We will put that on to the November meeting if we have time. Um, governance process. Uh, we need to appoint a representative to the RNES Teacher Negotiations Committee. Um, is it just one, or more, we can have more than one? You rep? can. You can we have, have more than one, want, right? You you can have more than one. You have appointed Lisa Page, and she's still on it. But the okay. committee is down to Lisa and Brenda um, because John stepped off. Oh, and Jeff Spalding is on for Barstow. And if that's fine with you, that's fine. But I wanted you to know that John stepped off. Okay. So is anyone interested in being on the negotiations committee? Um, is it just teachers? Cause we did agree to a, or is it both? It, it ideally would be, we're only asking for a teacher here, but ideally it would be both, yeah. So, cause both are up, correct? That's correct. Okay. And teachers first session is next week, the 13th. Okay. Is anyone interested in being on the negotiations committee? Okay. Well, I would tell we you really they should we really should have somebody from the board on there. Well, we um, should. So, but I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to hold up the meeting. I think if someone were to decide tomorrow that they wanted to be on it and emailed me and or um Jean that we would not say no. So It really is important that we have members on that board. I mean, that is the teacher negotiations, that is 90% uh, of our our budget is teacher salaries and benefits. Well, total salary and benefits, not just teachers. Well, right, exactly, but still. And paras, I'm including the paras in that as well, so. So it's a big chunk of our budget. Um, I think it's important for teachers and paras and all of our staff to know that we are um, engaged in that process. Well, if you guys change your mind, if someone decides that they would like to do it, let us know and we will let you know when the next meeting is. Um, we do need to appoint a representative for our October VSBA annual meeting uh, for the proposed regulations. I thought we already did that. Didn't we do that for you Bill? Did, you did Bizbit and VHI. Oh, okay. So, RNESU and Barstow have appointed you, Lori. Ah. 
<laughs> so we need a, a rep. So if nobody else is going, this is virtual. I'm, I'm already doing it for the other two. If you would like me to do it for OVUU as well, I'm happy to do so. And if someone else would like to step in, I'm happy with that as well. Can you, can you say, speak? sorry, I didn't raise my hand. No, sorry, probably the same question. I, what is it again? So this, is, <laughs> yeah, this is the VSBA annual meeting that usually happens every year um, during conference time. Um, it's usually at Lake Maury this year. It's virtual. Um, it's just to have a representative uh, of each board to go and vote on the proposed resolutions that are um, in front of the board, just like we do for Visbit and VHI. So this is the is SBA, it, and I'm sorry, I'm I have so many papers in front of me, I can't even find. That's okay. Um, what is the, it? The one that's tomorrow? No, uh, no. This is October 29th. I'm pretty sure it's the 29th. Yep. Okay. okay. It's not the same night as the Beehive one, though. They're in two different. It's at nights. it's at night, though. Yeah, five o'clock. I can do it. Okay. If nobody else wants to. I wouldn't mind going. I don't have to be the person. Well, everybody can go. Anybody oh. can go. This is just to have somebody be the rep for, you know, who gets to vote. You be the rep. Barb, we can tag go. team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you go. No, you go. You go. We'll go together. There you go. <laughs> do you want to drive or do you want me to drive? Oh. Sure, I'll drive. <laughs> I'll drive you right to the internet. <laughs> okay. So, okay. which one of you wants to be the rep? She does. She does. Angela okay. wants to be the rep. So well, can I get someone to make the motion to let Angela be the rep? So okay. moved. Barbara's making the motion. Somebody make a second, please. Derek is seconding it. All those in favor of Angela being the rep for the October VSBA annual meeting on the proposed resolutions, please press that green button. If no, please press the red button. Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Angela, you have been approved. All right, um, we're going to set the bu board budget parameters um, in our executive. Uh, I almost said limitations, but our executive session. There we go. Um, but our next item is board member recruitment. Um, I'm sorry to say that today I received the resignation of Nikki Bearer um, due to work. Uh, her work schedule. She has meetings every Wednesday night uh, or, and that they fall on every Wednesday that we have a meeting. Um, so she will be stepping down from her position. So we not only need to have board recruitment for our, uh, positions in March, we now also have to think about um, putting something out there to find a temporary board member between now and March as well. Lori, do you recall, I can look it up, is, um, is Nikki a member at large replacement? Yes, she is. Okay. Yep. Yep, because she was, she had uh, showed interest along with the uh, two Pittsburgh representative, uh, potential so representatives. So your board has the authority to appoint a replacement to la to be in place until the March election, but whomever it is has to run to finish the term in March. Right. Um, in the past, you've solicited letters of interest. You actually had multiple letters this last time around. Um, so the other person might even be reached out to. I can't remember right now who it is. There were two. Yeah. Um, so Barbara, you have a question? Um, yeah. Point me, it, it's a point me in the right direction about where we um, gave, gave ourselves authority to do that. And can we not do that if we chose to and to just let the seat so sit empty until the election? It's legislative authority. And the reason I asked if it was um, a, a town representative or not is the legislature just renewed a clause that says if it's a town rep, then the school board has to consult with the select board. But when it's not a town rep, it's at large and you, you're covering all the towns, the legislature gave the full board the authority. To not do that would be 
to leave the seat vacant until March, and you have that option as well. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just going to echo what Barbara said. I mean, wouldn't it? I mean, by the time we get around to voting for somebody, and it, they'd be on the board for three months. So right. I, I would think, wouldn't it be best served to just leave it vacant until um, the general public elects somebody? Sure. And that, that yes. I, so when I said that she's resigned, you know, that's where we talk as a board and decide what we want to do. So yes, that is definitely an option. Um, Kevin. I had the same question that Barbara and Mike did. Okay. Um, Barbara again. Um, do we need to uh, take action at this meeting, like make a motion that we're not going to seek to fill it or that we're going to seek to fill it or What's the, um, the uh, I would just like consensus that people are not willing to fill it at this time. Not and, action is also action. Right, exactly. Okay. So um, unless someone makes a motion and then someone seconds it to fill the position, then we can say that we're not going to fill the position. So I guess that's what I'll say is does anyone want to make a motion to appoint someone? Okay, I counted to 10 and I didn't hear anybody raise their hand or say anything. So I'm assuming that no one wants to make a motion. No one wants to second any said motion. And therefore we will leave it blank or empty until March. And so we're just gonna have to be really good about making sure that people know that that seat is vacant and that they should um, uh, run for it. Because there are times when we have empty seats and people still don't run for it or, um, in the case of Bell Mathis, he didn't even know he was running and he won the seat. So uh, there's always that too. Okay, so the other thing is, is that um, for those board members whose uh, term is up in March, if you are thinking about not rerunning or um, the sooner uh, we know the better, just because then we can start putting out feelers to people in your said town or people at large so that they know that there will be a seat available. So please let us know. All right, communication and support to the board. Superintendent's informational report. So um, I gave you quite a few areas on the facilities update and a few pictures in case you haven't driven by Otter Valley lately. Obviously, when these pictures were taken last week, the um, signage was not yet on the building, but it does look beautiful. It does look beautiful. And we are moving forward with the auditorium seating, as you requested. Um, the OCA parking is specific to Leicester School. As you know, the deal fell through, the lease deal. So um, in order to do our health screenings, we needed to move the cars and have a safer parking lot and we'd like to keep it as a safer parking lot. So we have moved the cars over to the edge of the soccer field and we have found a vendor to provide gravel and create a decent parking area pretty quickly here um, within, uh, within budget, within $500 of budget, but it's within our budget that, it, that we, our operational budget. I wanted to give you an update on HVAC systems because of COVID and the talk about um, ventilation, just so that you have the lay of the land of where we are in all of our schools. So that wasn't requested, but I just thought it was a timely topic to bring to you. Um, legislative update is also in there. And I sat in, uh, VSBA offered a legislative update today from 3.30 to 5. Not a whole lot different from what I put in here, but they are recording it. So if you didn't attend and went to listen to it firsthand, it will be on the VSBA website shortly. Um, teacher negotiations do start um, October 13th. The uh, PFAS test results for Lester, the confirmation report came in that we do have elevated PFAS results. We also have been told that they are not in nearby um, neighborhood areas. So it's specific to the school. So now we're working, we'll be working with an engineer to figure out exactly um, oh, yeah. what the source of it is so that we can remediate it. Meanwhile, we're providing water and the kitchen is, is not being used for, 
for cooking. I did talk to you about Edmentum assessments. We didn't really, we've had, we've had individual assessments and we're still doing them. The, the PNOA, the um, teaching gold, I can't remember them all right now. We have an assessment plan and those assessments still exist for local assessments. But what Edmentum gives us is it gives us the opportunity, it's a, it's a software, so it's a computer interactive assessment that helps diagnose skills and deficits of our students and then helps to design a game-based, basically, approach to address any deficits and move kids forward in their skills. So we're using it as a supplement for our, for, we're using the assessments as kids are returning from three months of not, well, six months of not really being in school so that we can assess where we've lost ground, what we need to do, and then target those areas with kids um, and individually. Um, I had a Lester fifth grader today tell me, this is fun. So I guess, I guess the sophomore can, software can be fun. Um, so we're in the assessment process right now through October 19th. We also have redesigned our multi-tiered system of supports where our academic interventionists are going to be working with targeted students based on the assessment results. So we will finish assessments on August night, on October 19th, and on October 22nd, we will start a six week intervention period with targeted students along with this um, Edmentum, I mean, a, teacher delivery instruction, one-on-one -on -one or small group intervention um, system. And then we will assess again at the end of that intervention system to see if, if that intervention is making a difference or if we need to change it. Um, and then we'll do those cycles throughout the year. So it's assess, intervention, assess, intervention, assess, intervention. It's very targeted to where it's needed. And for the students who don't need it, the skill path just continues to give them skills. Um, it's not all remediation. So we're really excited about bringing that into a, a much more, I guess you'd say scientifically based intervention program. Um, Reentry, um, as, as you know, we announced phase two and three of bringing the kids back into school. This week, we have all of K4 in school, five mornings a week, um, an increase from K2. And in two of our schools, we have room to bring in fifth and sixth graders in the current guidance, which says they must be six feet apart. In two of our schools, we don't have room to do that. Actually, one of your schools and Barstow don't have room to do that. So Barstow is bringing in fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth right now, um, two days a week, 50% of the kids. And Neshebe is bringing the fifth and sixth grade teachers in this week to work directly with the kids who are in the pods. And then next week we'll be bringing in, um, I believe it's all fifth and sixth graders, but wait till you get my write up on Friday before, to be absolutely sure. Now should be as confusing a little bit because of its staggered start around fifth and sixth. We just got the word from, and Otter Valley is bringing back seven through 12th um, next week in a 50% hybrid, two days in person, three days remote. District wide, we are taking Wednesday as a total remote um, learning day so that because we're asking teachers to be teaching remotely as well as in person at the same time, which takes an entirely different skill set, not just technology, which still is an issue for some, but largely it's really planning your curriculum very differently to be able to manage both things at the same time and to be able to let parents know the week before or the Sunday before what the schedule is going to be. Um, so, and additional time to collaborate with your teammates. We also had spent, just a reminder, this summer time identifying the high level um, standards that we want to make sure elementary meets in particular and the high schools working on proficiencies so that we are providing the highest quality of education as we can. Um, the state, the Agency of Education just yesterday announced a change that 
K6, kindergarten to sixth grade, can be three to six feet apart. That was very exciting news to us. So what that means is that we will be able to bring in all K6 students in our Arta Valley schools and Barstow for that four days a week full time, um, the week of October 19th when we go full time. And that's, that's very exciting. Um, the return of third and fourth graders on Monday went very smoothly. Um, we, you know, it, it adds more, more people to that health screening. But um, I think we've, we've got that down now. We also are, um, once we get to the October 19th week, that plan is intended to get us through the COVID experience. Um, not continue to make changes in the plans. The intention was way back in July that we were gonna phase our way into the school year. In mid-October, we'll be fully into what we're doing. That can change if there's an outbreak or we don't have staff capacity because of staff outbreaks or if there's a snow day or if we, there's a vaccine and we can bring everybody back and not worry about it. Um, you know, it, it can change because of factors we don't know right now, but there is no planned incremental change ahead of us. We're settling into a routine. Questions? But, and then I'll talk about IRS if you'd like, but questions on reentry first? I'm following Lori's 10 second rule. Okay, so on IRS, as I notified you in writing on Tuesday, we recently received, and Charlene, I can send this to you. We recently received a notice from the IRS that we had not filed our 2018 W-2s with the Social Security Administration on time in that year, 2018. As we researched how this could have happened, we realized that the filing due date that year changed from March 31st to January. We did file for the March 31st date, but it was no longer the correct date. The staff person whose job it was to do that did not real, realize the change. That staff person also no longer works for us. Um, although she did work for us in 2019, so we are researching to see if the same thing happened in 2019 or not yet. We have not received official word, but we're proactively looking into it. We also are talking with the IRS to remediate the situation. We have not had anything like this happen in the 27 years that Brenda has worked as business manager. And so, but that we do have potential liability, uh, potential finding. So we're talking with them to either forgive or minimize any potential findings based upon what the error was and our record. We don't know that answer yet, we're working on it. It is our responsibility to comply with filing dates. And so as I pointed out to you, this puts me in non-compliance with policy 2.3 financial conditions and activities. And our plan to get into compliance is both obviously setting our calendar for this January to do it correctly and resolving the past situation with the IRS. And we anticipate having um, January be correct. So by January, I'll be in compliance going forward. The IRS, I never know how long they'll take. Any questions on that? Barry? Um, Kevin? Never, thank you, Laura, you saw the hand. Sorry, Barry, Kevin was first. It's okay, I, I wanted to know uh, what's the potential bad news? How, how high uh, could possible financial penalties be? We actually have no idea at this time. It could be anything from, I mean, it could be zero. I, I don't know. Gene, I, I just wanted to say, um, it, it sounds like you're on top of this completely. And even for corrective actions going forward, um, it was really a change in a date and you've got a handle on it. So there should really be no concerns for future occurrences. And the point you made in your report about 27 years, Brenda's been there or 25 years of, of compliance should go a long way 
um, towards having this be a non-issue, hopefully. Hopefully as well, thank you. Barbara? I just had an, I just was noticing the time. Do we need to make a motion to continue meeting so we can? Um, it's 7.58. Uh, let's let her finish her superintendent's report if there's anything else and then we can, we can okay, do that. I, just didn't, I didn't know if you needed a motion or not. Okay. Yeah, well, we've got a couple of minutes. We didn't start till 6.03, so I really have five minutes. So anything else uh, for your, the superintendent report? Questions or, or any discussion for Jean? That's all I have. Okay. All right, so we're gonna do the consent agenda. Uh, Kevin, you had mentioned that there was something you wanted to pull off. Yes, thanks. I wanted to pull the September 23rd minutes. Okay, so we're pulling off minutes. Um, anybody else before we move forward? Okay, so I will take a motion to approve the consent agenda without the minutes included. Um, who would like to make that motion? Barbara would like to make that motion. Who would like to second that motion? Kevin's gonna second that motion, thank you. Um, all, all those that approve, please hit your red or uh, green button, excuse me. Um, those that disapprove, please press the red one. Uh, Barry, I don't see an answer from you or from Bonnie. Okay, I, thank you, uh, Barry. Bonnie, thank you for that. Okay, consent agenda passes. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Mike, did I, did, were you okay? I don't remember if I saw him. Yes, thank you. All right, so um, now I need a motion to approve the minutes and a second, and then Kevin, we can have discussion. So would someone like to make the motion? Barbara? Um, second? Second. Bonnie, okay. Mm -hmm. Discussion. Kevin? Yeah, under, uh, it's page one of two on the minutes on the 23rd under uh, section two, board professional development policy. Uh, it's very sparse. It says, Jean introduced the speakers, Marceline Du Bois and Paul Gorski of Equity, Literary In Equity Literacy Institute. And then the board then moved into a presentation with breakout group on racism, Black Lives Matter and equity. Uh, I want the record to show that uh, I objected strenuously to the historical and sociological assumptions of the presenters. Okay. Um, do we need a, a motion to put that? Well, actually, yeah, we would need a motion. We need All a right, motion. So I, I still that. move that. Okay. So you need a second? Would someone like to second Kevin's motion? I'll second. Okay. Discussion. Anybody want to discuss that or can we move into a vote? Ten to ten. I didn't hear anything. All those in favor of Kevin's motion uh, to amend uh, with his um, comments, please signify by uh, with the green button. Those of you that disagree, please use the red button. And of course, you can also abstain. Okay, uh, Bonnie C. Okay, thank you. And Barbara? Okay, it passes. Uh, Bonnie Bourne? Mine's green. Oh. It went away. So there if you you're okay with it. It's back. Right. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Okay, so it is now 802. So we do need a motion to um, go past our time limit of two hours. All we really need to do is talk about our next board meeting and our executive session. And accept the, um, accept, oh, and accept the monitoring report. Right. We did not do that. So, um, we really probably need less than 15 minutes. I'm thinking 
So if someone would make the motion to extend our meeting for about 15 minutes. Barbara they, is making the motion. Can someone second? I will. Uh, Derek, okay. All those in favor, uh, green button again. All those opposed, red button. Laurie? Yes, Charlene. Well, okay, so you made a motion to approve the minutes of September 23rd. Uh, Barbara made the motion, Bonnie seconded. And then Kevin and Angela made a second motion, but you never um, called the motion for the first. Oh, well, I figured that with the, um, with his, uh, that it was a friendly amendment, but um, Barbara and Angela, or Barbara and whoever made the original motion should verify that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Friendly amendment. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I would call that. Uh, okay. So, so I'm taking Kevin's and Angela's motion out then. Right. Well, you're putting it in as a friendly amendment. And then no, my own, my only question was you never took action on that first motion. Oh, no, because they don't take action until after Kevin put in his change to it. Okay. Right. And then they took action. Okay. <laughs> I'll put I'll put it in the way I see it. And you can let we'll me fix it if yeah, that okay. sounds fine. Okay, so uh, everybody make sure that you're, Barry, I don't see you. No, Barry was there. Mike's the only one I didn't see. In. Okay. So Mike, uh, do you agree with extending for 15 minutes? Um, as, as I, I sh my computer shut down twice. I oh. lost internet, so I, I guess we're doing, I don't care. Okay, all we're doing is extending the meeting by 15 minutes. Okay. So uh, we're extended. First thing I would like to do is go back and accept the monitoring report. If someone would make that motion, which was Gene's monitoring report for 2.8. So moved. Okay, Bonnie's making the motion. I saw uh, Brent, uh, Barbara's hand go up, so I'll consider that a second. All those in favor of the monitoring report, uh, please use your green button. All those opposed, please use the red button. So I just need uh, Kevin and Barbara to, okay. So it passes with one no. Okay, thank you. All right, so our next meeting is set for Wednesday, October 21st at 6 p.m. It will be online. Um, we will be discussing um, the September 23rd professional development recap and reflection um, and there'll be probably be some other stuff on there. Um, I haven't decided what yet. Um, and then uh, if everyone is okay, we'll go into executive session at 8.06, although we need a motion for that. To discuss a, um, to discuss budget. So moved. Okay, Derek made the motion. That was me, Lori. I muted you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unmute. Okay, here I am. Ah. Okay, so Derek made the motion. Did someone second? second? Harry seconded. Okay, thank you. Um, then we will head into executive session at 8.07. Um, I don't expect that there'll be any action, Charlene, but we'll let you know when we end. Okay, thank you.